You are listening to Fanta Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Wolcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to episode 64 of Making Tracks, brought to you by the fine folk over at fanfortracks.com. I'm Mark Wolcaster, one of your co-hosts, and I am joined, as always, by the man, the myth, the legend... Mr. Mark Newbold. Mark, how are you doing? I'm good, and I have miffed off many people, I've got to tell you that. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I've spent this morning doing something I haven't done in probably about 10 or 15 years, and that was... Can we talk about that on, on the podcast? Yeah, we totally can, actually, because I spent okay. the morning playing uh, Episode 1 Pod Racer on the PlayStation. Oh, wow. Envious. Yes. I think I, I got a, an email or something saying that I'd been reduced to like seven quid or something from a PlayStation Ooh. Store network. So I just downloaded that. Um, off you go. It's uh, nice nice and fun. Doesn't actually kind of like look any different, I don't think. Um, but it's a nice, fun game to, to while away the morning with. So pretty good fun. How about you? How's things with you? How's your Star Wars week been? Well, it's another Mando week, isn't it? So Mando Mondays are really busy for the site. Another cracking episode of the show, which, of course, we'll talk about in a minute. And... And? Seamless link. Uh, Lego Holiday Special came out on the 17th, the 42nd anniversary of the original Holiday Special. It was a bit good, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was good fun. It was slightly longer than I was expecting. I think it, when we discussed this last week a little bit, because you had seen it, didn't you, um, after the Anthony Daniel uh, press conference... That's right. I tell you what, I was kind of blown away by how good the voice actress was for, for Ray because she sounded dead on at points. Yeah, I mean, when I watched it, I was half expecting, because obviously they'd made a big deal about it being Kelly Marie, fantastic that she was back, and, and obviously Anthony, ever-present, and Billy D obviously loves doing it. So all those guys and, and the, you know, the Clone Wars crowd, as we still think of them, you know, doing all a lot of the other voices, and all of that was wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, when I listened to the inverted commas Daisy voice, and I was like, is that her? Has she done this and she doesn't want people to know? I think we both do. I've got a pretty good ear. And I was listening to the, whoever did Boyega, I thought, that sounds nothing like Boyega. And I listened to whoever was doing uh, Poe, and I thought, that sounds nothing like Poe. And then I listened to the Ray, and I'm like, that's Daisy Ridley. Mm. It's got to be. And it wasn't. It was so good. Yeah. So if ever they do animated Ray and Daisy doesn't want to do it, and she did do a piece this week talking about, I mean, clearly she's a Mandalorian fan. She, she spoke about watching Mandalorian. She got involved in the, the Baby Yoda egg issue debate. Um, and had her opinions on that. Debate, yeah. Um, and had her opinions on that. And clearly she's a fan of the Mandalorian, but then said in the same interview, well, I kind of feel like I did everything I need to do with Ray. Any of these actors, if they want to move on and do other stuff, they should. Obviously, any working actor should. They shouldn't be slavishly devoted to Star Wars. It's just another gig for them, isn't it? For us, it's more, but for them, it's a gig. But it's smart also not to burn your bridges, and I don't think any of the three of them have burnt their bridges. If there was the opportunity to do Disney Plus animation or Disney Plus live action, now... I think animation is probably the most likely that you would hear or see any of them again. But that being said, if ever Daisy didn't want to do it and just thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stick to my guns and do something else, this lady clearly can come in and be Ray. You wouldn't know. You just wouldn't know. It was fantastic. I loved the whole episode. I thought it was great. Yeah, I thought it was really good. Watched it in HDR and it looked just phenomenal. But I just thought it was just really good fun. And it, I suppose it's a great way to kind of celebrate the whole Skywalker saga by kind of going back and, and having fun at, you know, some of the bigger the bigger story moments throughout the saga. We'll talk about it more in later episodes and in the week on Fanta Tracks. There's a review coming of uh, the Rancho Obi-Wan virtual gala. And one of the guests, late announced guests, was Seth Green. And Seth Green got asked by Steve Sansweet, what about detours? And Matt Senreich was on his co cohort at Stupid Monkey, and they both touched on the detours thing. Seth Green said, basically, it was felt by Lucasfilm that when the Disney sale came in, that now you've got a new trilogy, the sequel trilogy, that they didn't want to mix the message of, you know, new kids coming into Star Wars, their first ever real encounter with Star Wars would be 
detours because, you know, Seth Green said, you know, I know people who's, who've got kids and their first introduction to Star Wars was via Robot Chicken or Family Guy or, you know, other avenues or Lego or whatever it was. And in the chat, there was a thread going alongside you as we were watching it live. One of the things that was said was basically the way Seth was describing detours was like, well, that's basically what Lego have done. But Lego have been doing it for a long, long time. So, yeah, uh, he kind of equated it to almost making it a Simpsons version of Star Wars, you know, with a group of characters, which the bits we saw of Detours was kind of that. I've got, I've gone off on a detour of my own here. <laughs> we, we talk about the Lego holiday special. But it, I really enjoyed it. I really hope Anthony, what Anthony Daniels said in the press conference comes to pass and that it is a regular thing that we the do first get. of many. Yeah, you know, we get one next year. It's well yeah. worth it. Well, I mean, it's interesting you do bring up Detours. The one... I don't want to say complaint, but one thing that I think is maybe starting to get a little bit old is the way that all these satires or parodies or whatever you want to call them, be it Robot Chicken, Family Guy and, and Lego, but how they approach the Emperor and Darth Vader kind of relationship, and especially in particular Darth Vader, because he yes. always just comes across as a bit of a bumbling boob or idiot or whatever you want to call it. And yeah. and so yeah. what I'd quite like to see would be a slightly different take. I mean, obviously, I suppose it's difficult to have the kind of the menace and the scary side of Darth Vader and the Emperor in something like Lego but also it just felt like any of their scenes could have been from Robot Chicken or it could have been from Family Guy it didn't necessarily feel that original whereas I think some of the other stuff did feel pretty fresh that's a really good point because I I did think the same I thought this is you know and then again on on the ranch I think yesterday they showed some Robot Chicken clips Seth Green said the the first Star Wars skit they did on Robot Chicken was the one of the of Palpatine on the phone after the Death Star has been blown up. That whole that whole and that was before they had the deal with Lucasfilm. Then Lucasfilm came to them and said, "We actually really like that. Let's do something more." I didn't uh, know that's yeah. the way round that it was, and it, it is that relationship it's exactly like you say it's basically the same in all of these things and i kind of think well you look at something i don't know pick a silly example look at he-man you know which was a kid's show and it had humor but it had action it had drama and i know this is lego and lego is probably a bad example to do because obviously there's no real peril in the lego star wars holiday special every time that that key spun and ray got pulled into the vortex and vader was chasing her and they all went off on these crazy and it was so well observed all the stuff they showed but you're right it would be really cool if they did one where the Emperor or, or even Vader more so Vader I keep thinking you've got Kevin Scott and, and Nick Brockenshire and Absolutely, all these IDW yeah. guys doing these wonderful Tales from Vader's Castle comics and you had the Lego Vader's Castle which kind of played off the back of Rogue One and and all the different things that came out around that and it, that kind of feels like its own little corner of the Star Wars galaxy the whole Vader's Castle thing and that to me is screaming out for, anim- for animation and I think you could do something kind of scooby doo ish in a cool way with that as a thing you look at Skeletor in He-Man, a Vader version of that would be different because you're absolutely right. The, the Vader, especially the Vader-Emperor relationship, is transposed from one of these IPs to the other. It's a very easy thing to watch and it's easy to just kind of get swept up in it and it's just enjoyable and it's light. And I kind of forced a girlfriend to look, pay attention, just watch this. Don't keep looking for it. Just enjoy it. Just, you know, this is something that should be enjoyed and shared with the family. And it had that nice kind of vibe. And it does make me think, oh, I wish it almost come out in December for us. And so it was a bit more like a like Christmas special because like for me in November, it feels a little bit too early, but maybe that's because I'm a bit of a Scrooge at heart. Hi, this is John Morton from The Empire Strikes Back, and you're listening to Fantha Tracks. This wasn't the only thing which came out this week, was it? It wasn't. We've been spoiled, but I feel like the guy at one of the ambassador's parties in a Ferrero Rocher advert at the moment. We're getting spoiled every week with stuff. What oh, was yeah. your kind of like general thoughts on, on the chapter? Wow. I mean, it really did have... A, well, every episode has. This is the thing about The Mandalorian. It really does tune into that OT vibe, but also gives you prequel nods and in this episode and we'll get into it in a minute you know even sequel trilogy nods i think in this one but really it had that a new hope vibe it had also get bearing in mind we're only 12 episodes in and a lot of season one it was a bit like rebels a lot of season one of rebels was on lethal and a lot of season one mandalorian was on navarro and we've gone away from navarro and traveled around a bit and now come back and it was kind of cool to come back it felt there was a nice familiarity it's like 
this is a location I like. I enjoyed being here for these stories and a lot of history on this planet already. And, and I enjoyed being back there. Also, the passage of time. You know, we, we met Cobb Vanth in episode one of season two and he was the marshal of Mos Pelgo on, on Tatooine. And now we come back to Navarro and Kara is the marshal of the township on Navarro. So that was that was interesting and grief feels more embedded in the town yeah. it almost feels like they've got a community and that's an overused phrase a bit naff but you know there's there's community feel to this part of navarro that they're trying to push on and make better there's progression yeah uh, and that's the thing you know i suppose you could say bear in mind that they pretty much leveled the place by the end of uh, season mm. one it probably goes to show but actually i would think anyway that the time that the mandalorian spent in transit from last week's episode to maybe this week's episode was probably quite a big period of time. I agree. That's one thing that's in the review was that one thing that I, that I didn't quite jibe with me was that passage of time. But also you've got a Mandalorian publishing program coming out, IDW doing a comic, Marvel's doing a comic, there's books coming out, Adam Christopher's writing for Delray. There's Mando stuff coming that will presumably fill in these time gaps. Navarro's got to be in the region of, of Tatooine. You've got to be down in that part of the outer rim. You can't not be if you haven't got a hyperdrive. That was and you did see him yeah, jump into possibly, hyperspace yeah. at the end of yeah. the last episode, as shonky as it was. But I still feel that he wouldn't be he wouldn't be traveling, he wouldn't be stretching his luck to try and travel from one corner of the galaxy to the other yeah. in that bucket as it was. Yeah. But then within this episode, he goes off on the mission to the base, all the stuff that happens there, he gets back to the township, picks up the razor crest, comes back and it's shiny, brand new, box fresh. That was a bit odd. They do seem to have these kind of like slightly convenient storytelling moments yes. in this series. Um, we ha- I kind of felt we had that with Chapter 10, with the X-Wing pilots coming back. And that's the whole thing. It's like we're kind of operating in, in a real small area of the galaxy, um, yeah. but yet it doesn't necessarily feel like small because they're not bringing in so many new characters at this, at this point in time whereby it suddenly feels like the whole galaxy knows everybody. But it seems like you've got like these recurring characters, like you would almost do in a in a more traditional kind of soap opera. Yeah, you know, and you've you've got your main characters, and you've got your secondary recurring characters that come back once or twice every season. But I was wondering if what Dave Filoni and John Favreau said about how by the midpoint in the the series we're going to start to see the focus shift, if actually that started to happen, because we have like, we kind of have this breakaway point in this chapter whereby the Mandalorian flies back, and then we kind of spend the time with Grief Karga and Cara Dune and that, which was um which was a nice touch, and it was a nice way to kind of get them out of that hole. But yeah, I was kind of slightly slightly shocked to see how quickly those Navarro engineers kind of managed to patch the Razor Crest back together again. In in story time, you've had things happen like Mando keeps leaving his ship for people to wander on and break and steal and, and plunder and whatever. And that just feels like a kink of his character. So I can kind of get past that. I don't mind that so much. And maybe that's just a... I, I, and that goes back to my old roleplay days when the most money I spent in-game on anything was the security of my ship. Because for my character, that was his castle. And so he protected it at all costs. So to have a character who's kind of blase about it. But then you, you've, you've learned over the time... Since he, especially in chapter two, when the Jabba's got hold of it, he's basically the A team in one person, isn't he? He can fix it, he can do it. He'll just roll his sleeves up, metaphorically speaking, and get on with it. So that's just him. But to take it back to to the township and get those guys working on it, that it was that you saw a mimbin, which was kind of cool. You know, see those guys go in and start working on it. You're thinking, well, that's not a standard ship. You know, okay, these ships are these vehicles are fairly compatible with parts. You saw that in Rise of Skywalker when Janna and Finn are talking yeah, on the ship. Yeah. Oh well, I've got this part. We've got a Type Three. We can use that. You know, there's, there's a certain compatibility. It's not like having an iPhone and a, and a Samsung and you can't use the same <laughs> power cable. You know, they, they, you know, you can kind of work around. So I get that there's there's that element to these ships, but even the outside of the Razor Crest was wrecked. It's just wrecked and I love seeing it like that it was really cool yeah. to see it like that but you think when she comes back in it's like she looked ama- I mean, it's an amazing ship she looked fantastic she looks like I'm hoping mine will look next November <laughs> when it gets delivered yeah. that kind of threw me because in in the episode when they set you know they turn the reactor off you see the lava start to go you're thinking this thing's going to go like Starkiller Base went in Force Awakens it's that kind of vibe clearly it doesn't. It, it can't because, like I say, Mando's got he's travelled back and he's got his ship and he's come back. Well, that's all well and good, but to have repaired it the way they did, that just felt like a slight oversight. And I know they do play a little bit fast and loose with timing and and the passage of time. But yeah, that was the one the one thing that I thought. Hang on, 
that don't make sense. Awesome scene. Great scene. You know, a proper laugh out loud moment with uh, Baby Yoda as he throws up everywhere. I mean, it's interesting because yeah. we are slowly getting introduced to more and more kind of foods and stuff like that. Each episode it seems to be like a... Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I don't know if that's like, you know, the, the John Favreau kind of influence because he's kind of like, he used to do that chef show and Chef, stuff like that's that. right, yeah, yeah. If you think of like chapter two with the Jowers and then him rebuilding it, that was done via montage. And yes. you use montages because it's a great way of showing a passage of time. This felt very linear, like it basically mm. happened within a day. You know, you plonk the child down at school and then, you know, you go off and you take out the last remaining Imperials. Yeah. What did you make of that sequence at the school? I love the fact that they turned the old bar into a school. The IG-11 statue in the in the courtyard was a nice touch. That was a really nice touch, which I didn't catch the first time. Uh, I saw it the second time and then I think Sanders' kind of article kind of... Uh, highlights it as well but i thought that was really interesting mm. it, it, it goes to show how they turned that whole town around from being some rough and ready place to say hey we want your kids here we want families to come here and, and live here and here's a school so yeah it's nice because it was you know very tc14 protocol droid and, yeah. and the map looked cool oh i love you you know me and maps i was buzzing at that i have made a career out of wearing a mask i want you to save your life by wearing a mask and maybe save the lives of others by wearing a mask. When we break into the laboratory, yeah. and you've got those two technicians, and one of them basically he blasts the console. I've not gone through it and freeze framed it or kind of like done screen captures and tried to Photoshop it to make stuff a little bit clearer. But I'm guessing, based on the fact that it was circular, that might have been some kind of Starkiller base type schematics. The whole kind of like underlying premise to this was really nailing down this whole kind of proto first order and starting to get into the nuts and bolts of actually how the, the first order was created. Did you think that, or did you did you think something different? Yes. In the moment, I didn't. The end bit with Moff Gideon on board the Arkansas class command cruiser, yeah. that scene when he's looking at all those dark troopers, which was pretty much straight out of Dark Forces and Jedi Outcast and all that sort of stuff, which was great. Mm. Um, that was fascinating. The fact that he called it, you know, the M count, because we can't say midichlorian for goodness sake, because everyone would just lose their minds. Even though midichlorians were created for Empire Strikes Back, that was fascinating. Obviously, it's tying back to Baby Yoda, all the, the tests and stuff that the Doctor had done on him in Season 1. But yeah, we know that at some point they step beyond trying to resurrect the Empire. To my mind, it needs somebody like, <laughs> I was going to say Alan Dean Foster, he's in the news for all the wrong reasons because of not being paid. I feel it needs somebody like Alan Dean Foster or James Lucino or somebody of that level to do a novel or Timothy Zahn, that really nails down the inception point of the First Order and the long build towards coming out of the shadows in The Force Awakens. It kind of feels like that. I'm just trying to remember how much gets discussed in the Aftermath trilogy, because I I think that is the one that really kind of starts to at least start to shape certain aspects of of, them going out into the, the unknown regions to kind of start to amass and stuff. Definitely the the meeting anyway, where they said, you know what, what we need is an image change and let's let's rebrand ourselves a first order instead of uh, the new order. Yeah, no yeah. one's at least shared the minutes of that meeting yet anyway. But I, I mean, I think James Ficino, you know, based on what he did on Catalyst anyway, would, would be the prime candidate for that. To me, this is where the whole thing is starting to really come together. Again, it was quite subtly done. We've got to remember that we're not seeing stuff from the perspective of, of a Jedi, whereas obviously when we're talking about midichlorians in Phantom Menace, we're talking, having a conversation between Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi who know what they are and know what they mean, whereas basically Boy. they've just stumbled across this recording and he's just said, oh, the M count. To be fair, it's quite easily uh, a believable shorthand for, for midichlorians. So based on the music, those could have been failed Palpatine clones in those tanks. I know some people have said they could be Snokes. Yeah, I've seen that. I think it's too early for Snoke. Yeah. We're still we're still sort of 26, 27 years before, there or thereabouts, before The Force Awakens, aren't we? So yeah. we know from the comics he was around. But yeah, it still feels a bit too early for that. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not. I think it was the music that did it. And also, I think there was one which was based on to the camera and that had a slightly Palpatine kind of like aesthetic to the face. I've not freeze-framed it and over-analysed it, but that's just my initial take. I was left thinking that we got a lot of exposition again in a way that was not 
ram down our throats and you know start story developments but also a bucket ton of action which was great and i thought it just for general vibe was good i thought the, the kind of banter between everybody was pretty good and it was really interesting choice bringing back the mithril guy from chapter one i wasn't yeah. expecting that um I was kind of slightly hoping by the end of it he would have been clipped or something by like a stray stormtrooper blaster bolt, but I didn't get my wish. But apart from that, because <laughs> um, I don't know, he's all right. But so far, I find a lot of these supporting stand-up comedy actors, um, they're fine, but they're best served in smaller portions rather than a lot of screen time, just because the more they seem to have, the more comedic they tend to lean. I liked him coming back because in that first episode, you know, he tries to talk his way out of it. He's, he's, he ends up in that carbonite block which he mentions i never got the side back of my left eye yeah that, that was a cute little kind of deep cut there yeah, yeah. of course carbonite freezing is an industrial process it's not for people it's an industrial process so so it was kind of cool that yeah. mando picked up and how no. did mando learn about this because it's not i don't get the sense it's a common thing there's lots of little avenues you can take your, your thoughts down when you get into it but I liked having him back. I kind of liked the, or not comic relief, because he wasn't really playing it for comic relief. He didn't want to be there, but he did his bit. He, you know, he's getting coerced no. at, at every turn. He loses his shit, mm. which I felt bad for him, you know, um, which was which was kind of a shame. That was quite yeah. funny, yeah. I mean, he's, he's sort of like a reluctant hero, isn't he, in, to, in some respects, you know. I mean, he didn't, He it's not like he kind of like ran around flailing. But wasn't he a bit like Frog Lady when Frog Lady got stuck in when she needed yeah. to? And, and he did his bit he more than did his bit when it came to it he was he stood up didn't mm. he you know he didn't just cower and step back and i like that and and the and the thought that grief and cara will give people a second chance because she gave those aqualish no oh, chance yeah, she was, was in brutal. there she was there to take them yeah. out no doubt and that was a great scene seeing them as well Cole Weathers can direct action yeah. action directing is difficult and he's been in god knows he's been in so many great action films over the years you think about it obviously Rocky essentially it's a sports film but it's an action film directed great you could tell what's happening in every turn through all of those Rocky films he's in Predator another film where you follow the action brilliantly he did all sorts he was one of those that slew of action guys in the 80s you know that did Action Jackson and all these different things that he did and, and forward to now where he's a Cole Weathers as a man is a personality you know and here he is bringing that personality to Grief Karga mm. He's picked up, obviously, on all of that great action directing that's been done around him, you know, and that translated onto the screen. You know, going back to last season's gallery episodes, he's the one actor who who really understands their craft, just the way he talks yes. and that. And obviously, you know, he's he's far more experienced than, say, Gino Carano. He's been around for a long time. So that's one of those things that he's probably just picked up along the way. That kind of stuff really helps, and it helps because then you pass it on to the rest of the cast, and I guess when you're directing as well, it means that, again, you're going to have a just a kind of more kind of stronger episode because of it. I mean, I don't know how much these directors get to kind of converse about the actual overall storyline beyond the mechanics of how you get from plot point A to plot point B, but... This felt like again a step up. Like the, you know, the last two episodes of, of this season have have really helped to step up the, the overall show. Bizarrely and not unsurprisingly, I'm I'm still seeing people on on my Facebook feed who are kind of slightly complaining that there wasn't enough story development, and I'm just kind of wondering how much more they actually want. I mean, do they want yeah. like a Empire Strikes Back? I am your father moment at the end of each episode, or is this one of these things that actually, when you look back from where you where we get to at the end of season two, to you know, and compare it to let's say for beginning, we're actually going to go well. Actually, that that story has taken us on a real ro- roller coaster. You get into season two, and quite understandably, he could be traversing his way across the galaxy, going to different places, not turning back and going back to familiar people. And also get the sense that maybe this is the first time he's needed to rely on mm-hmm. people. He knew grief already because grief. You know, he got a reputation and all the stuff he got, and it's almost like Baby Yoda softened him a little bit, but but not in a not in a bad way or a negative way, but in a in a in a good way. So he's now going back to people that he trusts. He went back to Tatooine to Pelly. He's gone back to Navarro to Grief and to Kara. He obviously sees her as a kindred spirit, you know. And Grief has he's got a history. He's the one character we know he had a history yeah. with before the show, before we really got into it. 
Bob Iger said that he sees the Mandalorian building its own sort of Mando universe, if you like. It's IP within an IP that they can spin off other stuff from. And what they do and when, who knows? I think there's room for animated stuff within the Mandalorian story. I think that could be fun. But this episode, because he was going back to somewhere familiar and relying on and taking and and accepting help from, you know, he had trouble accepting help from Quill. Mm in a way, if you think back to it. And, and and yet now these people, he's fought with them. He's, you know, he's bonded with them. He nearly died. Don't forget, Grief and Kara have seen him without his helmet on. Not many people have. So there's a bond there with those characters that there probably isn't with anybody else. I like the fact that he's gone back to them. That was a big story thing to me. The fact that he's gone back to people, he, maybe not friends. I can't imagine him breaking, you know, having a beer with him. It's not that kind of thing. Even though you do see him sort of drinking from the, the bowl with his helmet sort of tipped up and baby Yoda doing the <laughs> yeah. same. But there's a story development thing there for me anyway. The fact that he's he will go back to these people and he, and also he sees the after effects of, of his actions almost. You know, mm. he's gone back to a township that, like you said earlier, was wrecked in the last time we saw Navarro. That place was blasted to bits and he goes back and it's a thriving township yeah it, it does actually give us hope a little bit for the rest of the galaxy when you see that people can actually survive and thrive on navarro and i quite liked actually how grief cargo kind of felt like he had like a similar sense of responsibility that lando did in empire strikes back about cloud city that's true uh, i thought yeah. that was quite a nice touch Near, near the end, obviously, the X-Wing pilot basically makes overtures towards Cara Dune to join the New Republic. Do you think that's the potential jumping off point for this uh, Leslie Headland series? I'm still a bit spotty on that. I mean, she tweeted and waved around a copy of the Atlas. So she's very much into the geography of Star Wars, and she's clearly a fan. To pick up that book felt like a deep cut. And I actually messaged Jason Fry about it, and he he had heard about it and was understandably <laughs> very pleased that, that she picked up that particular book. And people keep saying it's going to be out of continuity and it's its its own thing. I don't buy that for a second. I, I, I don't buy that for a second. I think been taken slightly out of context, because I've, I've read that quote, and I think what she's basically saying is it was basically her way of kind of saying what we've heard for just about every single new adventure for star wars that um if they're going to explore a different point in time that hasn't been explored in a different part of the galaxy that hasn't been explored because i think that's basically yeah. what that she was saying was that it's going to tread new paths and it's not going to kind of necessarily encroach on the stuff that we know maybe that isn't the Makara Dune sequel but or maybe it is because I, I still find it strange that our main cast at least from a promotional perspective always seems to be Grief Karga, Cara Dune and the Mandalorian Moff Gideon and yet so far we've only really seen Grief Karga and Cara Dune once this season and they weren't in it a huge amount last season either there was more episodes when they weren't in it than they were in it I think she, as a character, has potentially got the strength and, you know, they could write for depth for the character to be a linchpin in a, another series. And I think that's what the Star Wars franchise needs at the moment. I mean, we do seem to have a lot of male-fronted kind of series coming up anyway, Kenobi and, you know, Cassian and stuff. It would be quite a nice take to do something a little bit different in that respect. But also, I suppose, really, where does Kara go from the end of Chapter 12? They've now rid the whole of Navarro of the Imperial Scourge, and she's got a vendetta against the Imperials. She may stay there for another six months or a year, but I would imagine she would probably get a little bit restless and maybe want to move on and, and try and help other people anyway. You know, when we first met her in Chapter 4, the first Bryce Dallas Howard episode... Yeah. You know, she'd obviously been through a lot and she was a jump trooper and, and, and the Alderaan connection, which was a you ever thought of that great idea because of all the history and, and stuff that goes with that, just the name of the planet. And now she's working, she worked with Mando, she's worked with Grief. There's obviously a connection there as, as friends and colleagues and such. And he's a powerful guy because he's head of the Bounty Hunters Guild. In they, they kind of make out like he's head of the whole Bounty Hunters Guild. Of course he's not. He's, he's, I would say he's part of he's head of the Bounty Hunters Guild in this part of this sector or this part of the galaxy, but certainly not the whole galaxy. Um, but nevertheless, she's found something. She's found a, 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 maybe a sense of belonging. She's got a mission. She's got a job again. I think as a character, she needs a mission. When the, the New Republic X-Wing pilot turns up and basically says... Yeah, you know, we're looking for good soldiers like you. I remember old around. You know, it's not that far in the in the rear view mirror. It's nine or ten years, and all the stuff that would have happened off the back of old around. You know, she gives. She walks away initially from that when he puts down the a, a sheriff's medallion yeah. type thing. 
she it makes her stop and think. So I think you could be right. I think if they do something further with her, you know, in two years' time when something, you know, the next thing gets announced at Celebration in a couple of years, we could look back at this moment and go, ah, there it was. That was the genesis of what we get. Mm. Maybe not the Leslie Headland thing on reflection, but more for Cara, that's where it will come from. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. Those space macaroons look delicious. I, I well, they, they'll definitely be at Galaxy's Edge. You imagine a bowl of them with some blue milk. Yeah, that, I'm up for yeah, that. Yeah, I mean they they looked a little bit kind of like in, in the HDR version. They did look a little bit vibrant. I have to say, especially after a baby Odyssey, because it's like, yeah, I, I I think I'll pass on the space macaroons. Hello, I'm Ahmed Best, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. Happy day! We had a listener's Ooh. question come through. We've actually got a couple in the bank now, so we can we can read the next one out. So I shall get to it, and it is from Lee Hawker, who I believe you know, Mark. Actually, I do. And full disclaimer: I did not ask him at any point to write in. And that is the truth. I believe it. I believe it. But the good thing is, he clearly listened to last week's episode with Steve Sansweet because his opening gambit is "Hi, Marks." Perfect. Hi, Marks. Having just watched Chapter 12 of The Mandalorian, so this is very recent, and seeing the connection it had with the sequel trilogy, in brackets, Clone Snoke, question mark, I wondered if this series will eventually improve people's views of the sequel films as the Clone Wars did for the prequels. Cheers, dudes. Lee Hawker. So thanks for that, Lee. I like that question because when you look back, and we were around for all of it, so you step back not that many years, and the prequels were not well regarded. And now the prequels are way more well regarded than they ever were when they came out and i don't know and i've thought this i don't know whether that's because the clone wars was so deft at picking up on threads in those films and in in embellishing them and and filling them out especially season seven with that final few episodes happening at the same time as revenge of the sith so you kind of now as fans you kind of think of not just phantom clones and and sith but also what was happening in the Clone Wars as well, as sort of one big pocket yeah, of story. Which, of course, that's the intention. Yeah. But also, now we're just past the sequel trilogy, it's getting the same rub that the prequels did. Oh, it's not as good as the OT, blah, 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 blah. And, it, of course, you've got new people who've come in through the sequel trilogy and this is their Star Wars, so they will quite rightly defend it and love it and that's their jumping on point. Like, there's so many now. So what do you think? Do you think The Mandalorian will make people look more fondly on the sequel trilogy do you think there's too much of a gap between the two for them to even be connected because to me mando is is ot what do you think i think for a large part there is a big problem whereby the sequel trilogy as we have spoken about had to do too much and i think it wasn't necessarily as well supported by the publishing program as it could be and i think that is in itself not the publishing program's fault but actually i think it's a byproduct of the let's see where this whole thing kind of goes not really having a necessarily huge overarching plan for that sequel trilogy plus obviously of course the change of directors and all this kind of stuff there could have been um and i've been crying out for ages like beyond just the kylo and comic book series i'd love a Ben Solo, Luke Skywalker, set 10, 15 years maybe or something where they kind of go off and Ben learns about the Force or something like that. Something I've, yeah. There's so much scope still to flesh out and build up things so that when we get to Force Awakens, everything goes, oh my God, wow. Almost in some respects, a little bit like what Rogue One did. Rogue One just made them watching A New Hope even more exciting. And I think I don't think I've been yeah. as excited to watch A New Hope in like the last 10, 15 years as I did the first time I watched Rogue One and then watched A New Hope. And that's obviously just down to brilliant st- storytelling and, and how Rogue One was constructed. But yes, film critics and people that I speak to at work who, you know, and we talk about narrative and stuff like that all the time, obviously in one breath say that The Clone Wars is really good because it helped flesh out so much of what the prequels couldn't. But then... You also say, should you have to rely on a TV series to flesh out stuff that you probably should have fleshed out Mm. in that film anyway? You know, it's very difficult because you've only got two and a half hours at most for a Star Wars film to kind of get across as much story and character development. Now, as soon as you start focusing on more than two or three characters, then that time gets compressed. And so it's very difficult to kind of spend the amount of time that we wanted. Uh, you know, this kind of comes back to the whole argument we had about, you know, Rose Tico and, you know, how she wasn't really serviced very well in Rise of Skywalker. 
So my hope is that actually, yes, for Mandalorian and subsequent TV series and books do do this. I think there's a lot of there that, and there's a lot of scope that they can do. And to be fair, the way that actually The Force Awakens opens does give you a lot of scope. I mean, I don't think we necessarily need to see Ray. Some of the books did do a brilliant job of talking about the creation of the Resistance more so than the First Order. It was almost like we focused on how the Resistance got formed, but everybody was a little bit nervous to talk about how the First Order did because I guess it ultimately fell down to who is going to be the, the overarching big bad at the end of a sequel trilogy. But now yeah. what we can do is, and and I think this, this week's episode does it really well, we just start to get these little nuggets. If they just feed every now and again a couple of breadcrumbs and that allows us to join the dots up, I think we're going to, after a couple of years, be able to step back and go, right, so this meant this and this meant this. And even this episode, like we now really know and understand what the Empire wanted with the child. And that is a big question, I think, ticked off, off the list. I get your colleague's point about you know, you shouldn't need to read a book or a comic or a TV series to understand a film. But then, by the same token, if the prequel trilogy had completely answered all the questions, you wouldn't have needed the Clone Wars, you wouldn't have needed the books, you know. So I think Star Wars is almost unique in, in that the scope and the and the canvas is so huge. You can have the films yeah. and then go off and do stuff that not only spin off from it, which is fun and fine, but actually fill in gaps and tell you more about you know and enrich the experience of watching those films again because we're star wars fans we're not going to watch any one star wars film just once we know we're going to watch it multiple times that's kind of the point that works for star wars the one thing i think about this question it's a great question from lee i kind of feel that in a way the mandalorian so and it's not a done deal there's a long way Mm. to go with the mandalorian so we're only sort of at the start of it really only 12 episodes in it's done such a good job so far of not only giving us the vibe and the feel of what we want from Star Wars, or what some of us, not everybody, but what some of us want from Star Wars. Probably certainly older fans are really getting a kick because it feels like Star Wars in a way that some of the Star Wars has felt so fresh and new, which is good because we need fresh and new to keep keep it going. The sequel trilogy didn't feel like it was planned. It felt like it was made up ad hoc and that they kind of almost fudged a finish almost by somebody having in the third film of a billion dollar franchise, somebody at the end has the eureka moment of let's make the bad guy, the emperor. And then it all fell into place. You know, it it feels like that should have been point one, right? This whole trilogy is about Palpatine coming back and regaining his power, but failing. That wasn't the case, but it felt like it should have been. Mm. And if you looked at the sequel trilogy without knowing the travails they had and the problems they had, you'd just assume that, oh, well, this was clearly always the plan, but we know that wasn't the case. So in a way, The Mandalorian, season seven of The Clone Wars, certainly, and even stepping back to the prequels where Lucas couldn't have planned it more, you know? He he knew where... It wasn't the case that he, he'd got it all planned and it was all... Everything worked exactly as I wanted because that's not how film works, you know that. But he knew the points he had to get to. He had to get certain people in certain places and characters in certain positions and certain people had to die and all the things that he had to do. It was the biggest tick list ever, the prequels. The prequels were uber planned. You know, whether you like what he did or not, he certainly had a list of things he had to determine and he had to achieve. The sequel trilogy doesn't quite feel like that was the case. And I think The Mandalorian, if anything, is showing it up. Season 7 of The Clone Wars really shows it up because you look at Season 7 and look, wow, look at how that fits. Look at what's happening on Mandalore, what's that's happening on Mustafar and all the things that you compare between Sith and, and the final few episodes of Clone Wars and how well planned it is and how well executed it is. And there's nothing wrong with the execution in the sequel trilogy. For me, I enjoy them for what they are. Whereas with the OT, I, I want to delve into it and learn more. And with the prequel trilogy, it's such a dense, rich storytelling that you really want to know more. But with the sequel trilogy, you've just said it, you know, certain books touch on things. I'm still spotty on a lot of stuff that I feel like I should know. I, I hold my hands up. I don't have time to read every book. I, I read every comic, but only once, generally, mm. because there's so much stuff coming to me. So if it doesn't so, soak in initially... It's it's Wikipedia and research for me. <laughs> Thankfully, I enjoy that, so it's not a big deal. I enjoy that, and I don't feel like I need to know everything now. You are right. There is there's something about the kind of sketchy way the sequel trilogy was kind of brought about, but yeah, meant that we're all kind of a little bit like, mm, okay, it doesn't feel like it's got yeah the the depth as the prequel trilogy. But you know, I, it's it's a whole comparison thing, isn't it? I think you know, there's one thought about 
thinks that people now that we're in the Disney area and there are a certain group of people who, for whatever reason, seem to be pretty anti-Disney on whatever they do, now obviously hold the prequels to a higher kind of level because George Lucas wrote and directed them. And obviously this is mm. the first Star Wars that hasn't had any George Lucas. And I think that's one reason why The Mandalorian seems to kind of, I think, get a, an easier time with the fans is because obviously the connection between George and Dave Filoni. Yeah, there's probably a lot to that. And I know, you know, one of the reasons, one of the, probably many reasons George sold, quite apart from the fact that he was cracking on in years and he wanted to retire and take his foot off the gas, God knows he earned it. But you think back to 10 years, to the battering that he was getting on a constant basis. And even him, who's probably quite remote from social media as it was, and the internet and all the other stuff, even in the interactions he would have had, got to the point where he thought, they hate me now, I might as well just sell it, let somebody else take it on, I don't need the hassle anymore. And now we look back through rose tinted glasses, thinking we wished he carried on, and I certainly do wish that he'd been 20 years younger, you know what I mean, and, and that he could have done that. But that being said, look at the amount of content we're getting now, the quality of content that we're getting, stage hand aside in this episode of The Mandalorian, little faux pas slipping through like that. I think... In time, the sequels will be better regarded, but I think it will be the ancillary material that will bolster those those trilo- that trilogy of films and fill out and answer questions and, and make it clearer the things that we don't know. Like you've just said, the formation of the First Order. We're, we're at the start of learning about that, really. Even though it's five years since Force Awakens, it feels like we should know this. Other stuff will fill in the gaps and give us satisfaction as to where the characters ended in very much the way that Lee says... The Clone Wars definitely helped the the prequel trilogy be better regarded. And also just the gap of time between now and then. Well, yeah, the time for one. But also I think that it will probably come down to how good whatever the next series of films are. Star Wars fans don't tend to embrace change as probably as well as we should do. So as soon as we get a new trilogy or new series come along, then the sequel trilogy, I reckon, again, people will look back and go, oh, I wish I did this and did that like we did in the sequel trilogy. That's just how it is. But as as long as we keep on getting Star Wars content and as long as it does link up and help to build a more vibrant and a more in-depth overall history to the galaxy, then I think we can't really complain. So thanks for that question, Lee. That was a really interesting one. And if you are like Lee and want to send a question in, be it about the sequel trilogy, The Mandalorian, Clone Wars, books, comics, whatever, this is how you can do it. Mark, how can a good folk get in touch? So if you want to be part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, please visit Fanthatracks.com or check out the Fanthatracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. Get that app on your phone. It's well worth it. Beautifully designed by Brian. Good thing to have. As soon as news lands, you get an alert. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions by emailing radio at Fanthatracks.com. Like I say, we've got a couple of listeners' questions in the bag. Please send some more in. And as you've just heard, we'll tackle anything, even the awkward ones. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Fanthatracks and be sure to to subscribe leave a review please a five star one on Amazon Music Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts Spotify or your podcast or spot speaker of choice and as always thanks to James Semple for composing the Fanta Tracks intro Adam O'Brien for our making tracks opening music and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers and be sure to watch Good Morning Tatooine our weekly news live show on Sunday evenings over at Facebook Live Fanta Tracks Facebook Live and on YouTube later in the week at Fanta Tracks TV episode 64 in the can absolutely and I'd just like to add that that fan for tracks app is free it doesn't cost you a credit so definitely everybody is worth downloading uh, just to keep yourself up to date on all the information and news that comes out from fanfortracks.com stay safe take care and we'll catch you at the next episode coming up next on fan for tracks radio it's making tracks